evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live. My name's Phoenix, and we're proudly brought to you by Smith Partners Real Estate and Down to Earth Electrical. Thanks very much for your support. Joining me tonight are the usual divas. Uh, Peter J, how are you going, mate? Oh, I've done it again. Peter, how are you going? Sorry. <laughs> I'm good, mate. Ready to roll. <laughs> very good. Macca, how are you? Yeah, uh, terribly well, thanks. Pleased to hear it. And uh, Mr Magoo, who's just uh, just uh, waltzed in and taken over the joint. How are you going, mate? Oh, look, um, and it's uh, wonderful for you all to have me here tonight. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> all right, well, look, enough of this. Uh, let's get straight into some Crows news, shall we? Let's go. Fina, I've, I've tried to compact this and uh, we'll, we'll work through it pretty quickly tonight because, of course, we've got Magoo who will need to um, have his competitions half an hour. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you just kick it along, fired. Pete. Just we'll kick it compact, along, mate, we'll, if you don't mind. We'll compact this as quick as we can. Um, just some some uh, late, uh, late breaking tribunal news. Gary Ablett um, has got off of his uh, of his charge, so he will be free to play. Um, and I think at the moment they're just uh, now arguing as to whether there should be um, any, even a fine uh, for the uh, for the great Gary. So um, uh, I don't know what your thoughts were on that one, but uh, I thought it was pretty wasn't surprising that uh, I, he I got off. It, and that's uh, nothing to do with the incident. Aren't, aren't no. they, aren't they uh, at the moment uh, trying to agree on compensation for Gary for tarnishing his good name? <laughs> oh man, I was, oh, that was where I was going. You beat me there. <laughs> nice. There'll be a full page report into how yeah. badly he was treated during the report. I actually think the AFL missed an opportunity because if they'd um, if they'd done this to him about a couple of weeks ago over Easter, they could have had the whole you know reported on Friday and revived by Monday afternoon. It would have been up. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. Very nice indeed, gents. But, uh, Macca, what did you think about that one? Uh, all I can say is if he wore a Crows jersey, he would have still got had his suspension. He would have got, would have got five. Mate, yeah, if he was right? Tex Walker, if he was Tex Walker, he'd be in some sort of anger management rehab. Yeah. He was to <laughs> yeah. phone in to kill his feelings every 38 minutes. Yeah, if, you look at the, if you look at the couple of photos you've got there, you can see just at the point of impact, Ablett is looking at his head. He is looking at his head. He, he's claimed that, that he tried to avoid it. Well, by jumping in there, well, it's a very strange way to avoid somebody to jump into the air but, uh, and go ahead high. And he is actually looking at his head as his arms making contact. Yeah. So, well, all I can say is he's Gary Ablett and in, uh, he's not Tex Walker. Very good. Uh, and good evening also to everybody in the chat tonight. Every, great to see everybody in there as usual. DSG, thanks for the shout out and uh, hope that you'll have a good evening uh, chatting away there. The other um, significant news and affects us in terms of the showdown is that uh, um, there was some news released uh, just in the last hour or so just in relation to Port's um, uh, injury um, woes and ruling some players out. So Brad Ebert will be ruled out. This week, of course, we know that um, Robbie Gray um, isn't playing and um, uh, Jonas is not going to come up and also Ollie Wines is out of the, uh, the showdown with a fractured ankle. Apparently he played through that um, yeah, right. for uh, part, of the, part of the game. So, um, yeah, it was uh, – so they are um, – I won't say decimated by injury, but let's just say they're tracking, you know, similar to us in terms of, uh, you know, we've got a few injuries as well. So uh, it affects all, all clubs, but um, I guess they're fairly, you know, fairly recent ones. Mm. Uh, i got nothing to say. <laughs> well, it's, it's fairly significant uh, because the players you've mentioned uh, are all good players. So uh, uh, unless they've got some... Great talent coming up uh, that we haven't seen. Uh, I, I think it does make them slightly weaker, but I think with showdowns, it's never really about so much as who's on the park as uh, how hard they go on the park and what they do on the park because uh, they're, they're never easy games. No, not at all. Um, the only thing I, I, that was good that was coming out of the slugfest from the weekend was uh, we seem to be playing a, a grinding out style of play and and sort of picking up some comments I saw from you, Pete, earlier the week, just talking about maybe a different game style. Um, you know, I think um, that could be a very interesting conundrum that we have in on Saturday night, whether the Crows go in for a really hard slog and Port have got some younger, softer bodies in there. I think that could be good for us. 
Yeah, it might not a bad point. We'll, we'll take, certainly take that up when we have a chat about that. Um, that donk. Uh, yeah. The um, another thing uh, just to to raise now. If I said to you guys um, just at, at the moment, if I said to you, I'd do you a deal. I'd do you a deal where I'd give you pick fourteen and pick nineteen, and you give me pick two. How, what would you think about that? Yeah, oh, take it. That's it. Would I'd you take, take that one? it? I'd take it, but no one would ever give us that deal, would they? No, no, no one would give you a deal like that. That's for sure. No. <laughs> cool, <Calvin. laughs> Sauce is so bad at football. <laughs> <laughs> it's a knob. Uh, uh, so I thought that uh, thought that might bring a smile to your face, but yeah, yeah. just don't go too hard too early. You never know. <laughs> but it's looking yeah, good so know. far. Uh, quite honestly, if you, I said this on Saturday night. Didn't, uh, Sunday night, didn't I, Mac? If you bury it for Carlton, would you be the most pissed off football supporter on the planet <laughs> at the moment? I mean, oh, for Christ's sakes, how long is this rebuild going to take? How many number? How how many first round picks are they going to get? Oh, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> What's happening? Well, well, sometimes you need to snip more of the plant to get more green shoots to come out of it, and then you need to take some graftings from the green shoots and replant those, and it's just a complicated process with green shoots. Uh, Phoenix, I don't think you understand me. I, I, well, I you think know. you just have to do a scorched earth policy down at bloody Carlton, just raise <laughs> the whole lot of it and just start again. Rub it out and start I, again, the whole lot. I think the AFL may end up heritage listing them. And then you <laughs> And they and they can't and they just can't be touched and they've just got to sit there and just just do it because they just can't give them any more than what they've already taken. Uh, it, just, you imagine well, Sauce, Sauce enough, knocking on Gil's door and Gil just going, I'm "Sorry, mate, I've got nothing left." Yeah, one well, thing about continuity, at least the, you know the, the parents can explain to their kids when the rebuild started and how long it's been going, yeah. where they're at. Yeah. <laughs> Although oh, I do think Jesus. it was a pretty harsh punishment for him to to enforce them taking Stephen Trigg, though. Like that was probably a bit harsh and <laughs> set them back a decade. Oh, look! I think he's done a power of good for that club. <clears throat> oh, you mean for Carlton? Yeah, no, yeah. he's cooked. They're all cooked. <laughs> I, I I don't know how you can support that team. It's you've got to think now. I mean, with the amount of first rounders and all that sort of shit that they've had. You've got to, at some stage, you've got to think that the club is just rotten from the inside out. If you're a member, surely you're thinking we've just got to get rid of these clowns because it's not working. Yeah. Yep. Well, look, anyway. Certainly you'd start with a coach and you'd see maybe some, some of the people that are, I mean, is Soss the genius he's allegedly supposed to be as well? Yeah, um, but is the coach the issue, Macker? I mean, he didn't pick himself. And look at how Melbourne went. And yeah, fair enough, Melbourne aren't going great guns. But you can't argue that Ruse got them uh, into at least a competitive mode for a while. And, um, you know, they've probably got a better base than Carlton at the moment. But they've gone and picked a rookie coach to try and get them out of a, into a, like, through a rebuild. Like, that when was is, amazing. That when, was amazing. Yeah. When is that ever going to work? How is that ever going to yeah. work? The guy's got no AFL coaching experience. And the club give him the responsibility of dragging them out of the shit. But not only that, I, the Sauce appointment I think is pretty sus too, because Sauce was given you know basically every first round draft pick under the sun to build that GWS list. Um, you know, even inside that GWS list, there's been a, there's a lot of gold, but there's also been a lot of lot of junk at the bottom. We don't and believe in labels at Maggers. an AFL list where every pick matters and every selection matters and every trade matters. And you don't have that, you know, you don't have the plethora of great picks that are just going to get you through. I think he's being found out as a list manager. He just doesn't have the talent to keep it going. I'd agree with that. Just uh, if we just switch on to a little bit of, um, if we've done that uh, topic, done just switch to a little bit of, yeah. bit of Crows news. The... Um, the Josh Jenkins thing continues to um, to be a feature of the uh, the presses coming out of uh, the weekend. So we'll watch with interest how that goes. I see Brent on the chat says that there's a bit of a room flying around that he may be back this week, uh, Josh Jenkins. So we'll certainly keep an eye on that one and perhaps chat about that when uh, we chat about the game yeah. in a few minutes' time. And the last one I had was just uh, a little bit of um, smoke coming out of Perth Radio oh, come on, today Peter. about... Um, Hugh Greenwood uh, on, being stitched up by Fremantle for next year. How do we? Uh, what, have we heard anything about that? I certainly haven't. But um, Peter, do we have to start calling of, you Peter J Hutchinson? 
<laughs> so that's a bit of a uh, bit of a bit of a rumor that's coming out of Perth at the moment. Um, no, is that a contract at the end of this year? Yeah, yeah. There, there is a there was talk uh, probably about no, a week ago that uh, the club was going to approach um, both Greenwood and Keith um, to extend their contract. So I would say that we, you know, if they if they don't re-sign within. So in the next couple of months, when we'd start to get an idea that maybe there could be some truth in it. No, no yeah. truth whatsoever. None whatsoever. Huey I'm not saying there Adel- is, but... Uh... Huey loves it in Adelaide. He's closer to his old man. The, the whole basis of that Perth radio report was on the back of the fact that we kept him out of the team because of protracted con- contract talks, when in reality it was because he had a limited pre-season. Like, it's just bullshit. It's, there's oh. nothing to it. Well, that's just, a, that's just about exhausted me for the evening. What else have you got for voice? <laughs> well, 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 thanks for joining us, Pete. <laughs> well, there's Stephen May. There's Stephen May from Melbourne. Yes, he's, that was an interesting one, Macca. He had a beer. The, well, um, you know, there's various uh, different, differing reports on that. Some said he had a beer and some said he had a belly full. So um, I'm not really sure what he had, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, Damien Barrett seems to think that the the stance that the demons have taken is is uh, control gone mad. Uh, that uh, there's no harm in a guy having us some beers on a Sunday afternoon, and I guess there isn't if he if he uh, has only had a couple. But apparently Melbourne's attitude is that uh, their policy is that players are injured don't drink at all, zero. So um, he's in the poo and. That's Melbourne's uh, attitude, and but he has he did arrive in very poor shape at Melbourne, and then he and he hasn't done he's done bugger all for him. He'd been injured as well. He's um, been a bust so, for Melbourne. Oh, a total bust at this stage. Yeah. Total bust. Pick six they go for him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's a, you want more? It's a big cost. Yeah. They paid a high price, and and they, they, what they really say his attitude isn't right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and he was a leader at uh, Gold Coast. Uh, you'd, you'd, hey, be, sort. you'd be you'd begs, be dark. It begs the question: Why would you leave Gold Coast, really? Because you're up there, you're at Cool and Gatter or Surface. You you know you're out of the public eye. There's no expectation. You, you know you're great climate. I, I don't know why everyone doesn't want to go there. To be honest, why would you want to come back and be, have to be responsible? <laughs> yeah, well, worry about winning right. games yeah. and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you big money, you get big money up there. You, you know, you're up at surface. You, oh, a lot. He, he did have a pretty, pretty comfortable, didn't he? Yeah. Anyway, look, I, I reckon uh, that's about all there is for yep. news. So uh, why don't we? Sounds good. Why don't we talk about what's going on with the crows? That's all I can give it. Otherwise, I'll get censored. Go for it. Do you want to have a, uh, just a quick uh, five minutes on the SNFL? Did everyone catch the SNFL on yeah, sounds um, good. Friday night? No. Um, was a, um, a, a ripping game of football. It was in the bog at, at Norwood. Um, very, very ugly conditions. Um, but uh, we, went, we went about five goals down in that game. And um, there were two skinny 18-year-old kids yeah. that uh, just decided that that wasn't happening on their watch. And um, they just um, they just dragged that team um, uh, together with some help from Pat Wilson. They um, they dragged yeah. that team from five goals down, and um, and and in the end won you know won eight, you know by a couple of goals. And so it was um, an astonishing performance from two eighteen year old kids uh, against and little kids as well um, against um, against men against a good football team in heavy conditions yep. in a night game. I- I didn't see the game uh, at all, Pete. Uh, obviously, McHenry was one. Who was yep. who was the other one? Jones was it? Jones, Chase Jones. Yeah, he had something like, I think he had something like about ten or eleven clearances, and you know, I mean, um, they no, they both had high twenties possessions, and they just, you know, they just, you know, they just dug in, and um, slight as they are, they just, um, you know, they they just got it done. Um, it was a, a terrific performance. Uh, from those guys, and it's, like what, you said, it? Pete, it's the, those the scrawny midfield. kids playing against grown men. They're so both in the midfield, Macca. Oh, that that that's really promising. Mm. They've so, got to be. Um, in. It, we, they've got to be in. We have to. Yeah. We have to get those kids into the team. That that is pure passion, and we've got a few little blokes playing with like that at the moment. Lockie Murphy's one in the ones that's just playing on raw passion. 
and we've got a few blokes that are sort of not going through the motions, but maybe just not cutting it in terms of intensity. And I just yeah, think, I reckon. I just think you get a if 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 a bloke like McHenry, um, and and you know young Chase show that level of desire and determination to get back into the ones or to get into the ones, we we got to give him the green pass. We have got to give him a run. Just quickly, PJ Crow, thanks for that, mate. Um, just. Just uh, adding there that in the last quarter when that game was on the line, Jones McHenry had eight clearances between them. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're obviously very, very promising boys. Um, but if you if you do bring him in, though, Fiend, um, I mean, the, the, the real targets that you're talking about are probably an Atkins uh, and a Riley Knight. Is that, is that the type of player you're talking about? Oh, I think so. Uh, you know, I reckon we, McKay comes out before Atkins. No, nah, you can't. I don't. I don't think you bring McKay out at the moment. I think he's doing all right. I think he is too. I reckon. Yeah, well, um, I think you're wrong. But yeah, anyway. well, I mean that's. I mean, look, you could go either way. <laughs> you, you could go either way, but I think we're getting more uh, run and carry out of D Mac at the moment. Uh, Rory Atkins has shown time, time again, and he showed again on the weekend that when it's a tough game, he doesn't get in line. And oh, he squibbed a couple of things. He, I think, I've been a bit of a defender for him this year, and uh, he, I reckon, he's put in his worst performance this this year, or the worst performance since he got dropped. Well, I'm interesting. Pete was he was Atkins is always Pete's man. Uh, so, where are you rating him at the moment, Pete? Um, look, I I, I think he. Um... This will be hard because I know Fiend will be ready to box on. But no, I'm... no, no, it's all good. It's all good. I have my say, so I don't know. You, you get free reign here. Yeah. No, I don't think. Look, I don't think he. I don't think he's been um, our worst uh, by far. I, I think that. Look, and I'm. I was a real G for him to get in the team. Um, but like uh, all good fathers, once my kid gets into the team, that's it. He's on his own. He's got to, <laughs> he's got to make his own way. So I'm not. You know, I'm not sort of wedded to. Um, him being in the side, and I think that he has his—he definitely has his limitations. There's no doubt about that. I think, though, he—you um, know—he still had. Um, um, now, uh, uh, it's an interesting stat, pressure acts. Now, I don't know if anybody knows what an actual pressure act is, but I know that uh, Rat had uh, 22 pressure acts um, on the uh, uh, in the game, and so, um, and, and as a comparison, Lockie Murphy had nine. So that that would tell you that um, if you're looking at that statistic, that um, whilst there is a perception that a player like Lockie Murphy is, you know, desperate and putting pressure on the opposition, whereas the perception is Rat is, you know, soft and just running around not doing anything, he's had, you know, almost three times the amount of pressure acts um, on the opposition. So, you know, there is some stats there that that that, that sort of favour Rat in that way. He only had 18 possessions. I thought he had a really, really good game the week before against St Kilda when we really needed him to step up. Um, I think he had about 27 possessions and he, um, you know, he, he went at a reasonable clip and in terms of his disposal um, efficiency. Um, he was a really effective player, I thought, against St Kilda. Um, but, you know, really, I suppose, a game like last week is not not rats go, and I think that plays into your issues, Fiend. Is that you know, in a high pressure game like that, he can drop away. Um, well, I don't think he was the worst. He was, yeah, look, absolutely. Um, I guess I'm trying to make a bit of a case for him. He, he had yeah. 18 possession, almost 300 meters gained, which is not really probably not, you know, that's probably a minimum pass. I think he's safe. I don't think he's going to be dropped anytime soon. I, I think that the player under pressure at the moment is Riley Knight. I thought, has to be. And I, I really like Riley. Um, I think he's, right? a, he's got a lot to offer um, and I've always enjoyed watching him play, but he just really, he really struggled um, on um, just with his, his, his touch, um, you know, dropping a few easy marks um, a couple of times when he had an opportunity to set up play, running inside 50 and just really muff the kicks and, um, just think he's just uh, struggling a bit at the moment for form, Riley. Um, and I think it's hard for him because I think I think he plays a difficult position in because he, he rotates kind of as a small forward up to the wing and half forward. And so a bit like Gallucci, they, you know, they, they play in difficult kind of positions um, to impact games significantly. And so I, I think that Riley is the one that's really in the frame um, this, this weekend. I, I reckon, um, um, Pete, I, my argument is not who's better or worse. I'm just really keen for the club to find out who our best 22 is. Yeah, and, and I absolutely support you on that. And, you know, I, I, 
I'm not. Disp- I don't think R- uh, Rory Atkins has been terrible this year. Um, I still. I mean, that pressure act stat is all well and good, but Lockie Murphy was probably in the game 20% of the time compared to Rory 75% of the time, you know, given where they play. But irrespective, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Riley Knight, although I, I feel like he's getting shown up uh, for a little bit of a lack of class. Uh, yep. Rory, Rory we've talked ad nauseum about. Um, but I just want the club. I think in past seasons we've gone with the best. We've gone with our twenty-two, and we've stuck with them, and we haven't really given the kids a run, and we don't change much, you know, unless it's forced and all the rest of it. I'm really keen for us this season to to really work out who our best twenty-two is. I mean, you can make a fair case to say that Elliot Himmelberg is now part of our best twenty-two, um, yep. and you wouldn't have known that four weeks ago. Um, you know, there's a case to be made that Riley O'Brien's part of our best 22. You wouldn't have known that four or five weeks ago. Um, and I certainly wouldn't have believed it. So I, th- I think my um, my desire is more about giving these kids a run and maybe, you know, keeping keeping that selection tension going. You know, it's always better when, when p- blokes aren't comfortable. And I don't think it hurts to, to make Riley and, and Rory Atkins um, just work hard for their for their selection and for their spot if it turns out that they're the best fit in the 22 great but i th- I, I would hate to go through another season where we don't die wondering i just i just want to make sure that these kids get a run and get the opportunity to show how they can contribute to the team and maybe they're the better option who knows yeah i couldn't agree more fine I, I think we, we need to do that I, I i can't remember honestly i can't remember a time when there's been so much pressure coming up from underneath because we've not only got these two first-round picks uh, from that great draft last year who are tearing up the SNFL, uh, as well as kids like Scholl and, you know, these kids just from last year, but then we've also got, you know, your group like your Himmelberg and these kind of guys that have been around, and, and O'Brien, that have actually been maturing away. It's almost like a perfect storm at the moment um, yeah. where you've just got so much pressure from underneath. Um, they're just tearing up the SNFL, these guys. Um, and if you put, you know, if you put, if O'Brien and Himmelberg play five or six games now, and then they get replaced, if they go back to the SNFL, they will kill it, and they yeah, will they keep will. that pressure on. Yeah. Mm. Um, so you know, you, you're absolutely right. And so we're, we, are, there's no doubt that we're coming into a period, you know, of change. Um, where pressure. I, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I really wonder about Source and how he's going to get back when O'Brien was, for me, pretty clearly best on ground on the weekend. Oh, probably apart from Fife, maybe. But for us, he was certainly best. So, I, yeah, I, I, I really, I really struggle to see how you can then, you know, um, dump him out. So it's, um, yeah, it's it, it's it's pressure in a good way. But you know, it wasn't just those two kids. There was uh, Stengel again as another guy. Yeah. He got, um, I think one he had goal, another. He kicks a lot five. of points. <laughs> yeah, yeah he kicks five. a lot of points. So if he did, if he kicked accurately, that lad, he he would have, you know, he would have been, you know, more than smashing the door down. But he's a very very clever and very very good player. Um, you know, watching him, um, you know, so there's, uh, he was good. The defence again was, was terrific. Um, Jordy Butts, I mean, Jordy Butts, I mean, I think he'll be, I mean, he may take a bit of time, but he's a 198 centimetre key position player that just runs around like, you know, like he's a midfielder. Yeah. Um, he, he's, he's phenomenal. Um, and he needs, you know, he needs some time in the gym and he needs to develop, develop, shh, excuse me, I'll get it out and develop physically, but he's a very, very talented player. You know, and then you've got you know Shoal and Hamill and these guys who are just you know they've just slotted into playing men's football like it's nothing. Yeah, and they are. It's not like previous seasons. These we've got a very young SNFL team this season. Yeah, uh, very young, and there's a fair amount of class all the way down the list. So, like most of our picks show themselves to be pretty classy sort of players. Yeah. So I even think... behind. Sorry, go on, mate. I was just going to say, especially with the um, with the the pressure on the small forwards, um, all those little players that we got up the front, uh, you know that's a really high intensity role. So why wouldn't you? Um, why wouldn't we trying to rotate a few of those guys through on a more regular basis as well? Like you know, burn them up, chew them up, use their energy, get the next one in, sort of thing. Uh, I thought we played some of our best football last year when we actually went to that to that mosquito fleet up front um, rather than too many tools anyway. So I just think we need to. I couldn't agree more with you guys. We've got some beautiful looking talent sitting in the back there. And um, and if we're letting people that aren't um, either giving 100% um, 
um, or putting out to 100% of their talents, then we need to be seeing what everyone can do. But then again, in the next two or three weeks, we're going to have the more pressure again in a more mature fashion with Seedman and Miller and Brown and yeah. maybe Jacobs as well, um, depending on how Riley O'Brien's going at, at that stage. Um, so, yeah, I think, with, I think with these young blokes, it's got to be uh, well, it's almost, almost a now or never situation because there's going to be that many senior players uh, buying to get back in that makes it very hard for the younger boys. Now, the blokes in the chat are cracking us all up with all their butt strokes. Um, <laughs> I'd I just like to put it out. There's a rule with Crowcast when you're talking about butts. It's got to be a little bit more original than Seymour or give him a crack or whatever. You've got to come up with something a little bit more original, otherwise it's just not going to cut it. Um, and we did have 950 comments in the chat so you, like, on Sunday night, so you blokes better get moving. Jeez. Guys, uh, I'll, I'll finish off the SNFL and we'll get on to the um, AFL game, but I'll just say one last thing. For everybody that's listening to the, uh, to the podcast, what I recommend you do, if you can't get to games, just get on to the SNFL Live Pass and you can just watch it on your phone or your iPad or whatever. It's not expensive. Get start looking at the if you're a, if you're a real close fan, just start having a look at these kids playing because at the moment I cannot remember a better time to watch our SNFL team. It's they are exciting to watch um, and it's well worth getting the pass. So I, I would just say that. Yeah, good advice, <laughs> Pete. Good advice. Right. So Pete uh, and Donkey, what do you think about uh, the free man to win? Magoo, you go first, mate. Uh, well, obviously, just on a on a completely surface level, um, it was probably one of the most frustrating games of football I've watched in my life. Um, always felt like we could break it through, uh, but never quite did. I thought our forward line looked unorganised um, pretty badly for for the first uh, for the first half or so. Um, and um, but what I did like to see was the fact that we weren't just um, you know, we went blazing away and turning it over all the time. We're playing some really tough, hard, sloggy, dour footy, um, to borrow a phrase. And um, and I did I did think to myself that, uh, you know, this is another example where the game wasn't being played the way that, you know, 2016, 17 Crows would have liked it. Um, but we came away with the win. So I was happy as a general, you know, we won, so I'm happy. Um, but we're watching something different that we've seen for the last couple of years. So my, my thoughts on that uh, was yeah, at, in, at times I felt like I was at the soccer and, and not just from the point of view of the score in the first half being 2-1, but it, it, it had that, you know, in a positive way, it had that, the, the crowd had that real tension. You know, it was an incredibly tense um, game to sit through. And I, I think that probably mo- a lot of people that went were probably mentally exhausted after the yeah, game. Yeah, it was a bit uh, like that. And so I... I think that, and, and, and a goal was, you know, when Hugh Greenwood kicked that goal, it was one of the biggest roars I can remember at Adelaide Oval. It was massive, you know, and it was like, honestly, it was like being at a soccer game. And I've been to a few, and um, that, that just reminded me of that. With soccer, you have that, you know, that continual trying to break down the defence, and then you, know, you eventually get one that's, like, amazing. So, um, but I, um, I did pose this question um, the other day, and I, I just, and I'm very, very interested to hear everybody's thoughts on this. And that is that it just, it feels to me like that we really have taken a bit of a, um, a left turn on the way that we play our football. Um, it, we look at our, statistically, we've only hit 100 points once this year. We've only conceded, actually, we haven't conceded 100 points at all this year. Geelong got 99. Um, and, and yet, you know, we sit with, you know, the fifth highest percentage in the league. Of 116 percent, and we sit to six on the table. Um, we've four times kept teams under 70 points, twice under 50 points. So, you know, and we're the, we're the third best defence in terms of points conceded. We're the third best defence in the league. So, I I just wonder if this is in the, in Don's own classic old terminology where this is um, a, a trend and not an event, and whether we have officially kissed goodbye 2016 and 2017. And that freewheeling, high-scoring game that we're all used to, and whether what we've been so frustrated about in the last, in the first sort of five or six rounds is an, an alteration to our game style, whereby um, you know we've we've built from defence, we're setting back as we've said a couple of times this year, we've set setting Matt, uh, much deeper back in defence, and um, um, 
just generally, um, you know, grinding out a win and, and, and building from defence and um, scoring when we can. I, I don't know. It just seems to me that it seems to be more of a, uh, a trend. How do you I feel think, about that? I think you're right, Pete, uh, in the sense where there's no doubt that, we, that our defence uh, sits back deeper um, and uh, makes it very, very difficult uh, for them to score. Um, the the amount that we score depends on the ability of the other team, you know, because I think uh, we are playing the type of game that uh, makes sure that we, we that the opposition don't get easy goals. Other than when Hardigan tries to think about it and then tries to do a pass, um, but in terms of the game style, um, it, we are making it very very difficult for teams to score. And then uh, on the rebound uh, and guys like Smith, for example. Um, and to a lesser when Miller was there, but um, uh, David McKay uh, mm. had been another one who's, who's uh, done a lot of very good dashes into the forward line and trying to catch them out on the rebound. So rather than all-out attack, as we were, or basically were doing before, it's more of a absorb it and then take the opportunity when it comes to rebound very quickly. So um, I think there is a definite change in the game plan. Just one thing to add, um, uh... I've got a, a good tip from PJ Crows um, about <clears throat> the extent that we're now pushing, particularly Rory Sloan and Matt Crouch back. And oh, yeah. I, yeah, and I, um, I actually went back and had a look at their heat map and some stats. And, and in the game against um, Frio, uh, Matt Crouch had seventy five percent of his possessions were in, in the in the back half, and Rory had almost seventy percent of his possessions in the back half. So yeah. interesting. Those two are now effectively playing as sweepers behind the ball um, yep. in defence, and um, so as well as sitting back, we've got and, and they're such good ball getters that um, it's just um, you know the fact that those two are also back helping what is already a good defence well, set deep. Pete, you have a look at Matt Crouch's centre clearance stats <clears throat> this year, yep, and yep. they are way down, and it's because we're not move, we're not using him like that anymore. We've got, uh, no. I think you you're. Uh, you're dead right. We've got C, Y and Huey um, in there doing the heavy lifting. Matt's playing outside at the centre stoppages. And you're right, mm-hmm. he, he is more of a defensive midfielder um, charged with almost guarding the back half, <laughs> if you like. And it's a very interesting change because we all wondered about whether we could carry those three blokes in the team at once. But given the separation of roles that we've identified here, and I, th- I think we're sort of on the money... Uh, it's a very interesting way to structure up, and we're using our outside players, um, you know, our wingmen and our halfbackmen more as our transition players rather than relying on the midfield. The midfield seem to have very specific roles around the ground now. And you have a look at Brad Crouch's um, stats, and he, if correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, but I reckon he's more forward. Yeah, you're spot on. He's seventy thirty in terms of his possessions. He's almost seventy percent in the forward half. Yeah. Mm. And and you're also spot on about C Y and Huey because those two are, are about fifty fifty yeah fifty and fifty back 50. so they're basically you know sort of around the as you say around the midfield so that's how those those five key mids are kind of two two one they're playing yeah. basically it's like a two two one it's uh, bloody in, in fascinating the soccer, in the soccer parlor yeah it's fascinating because that's not how midfields go and you wonder whether it's a change in structure. Uh, because of uh, to fit our personnel, which we've always been crying out for, you know, play the game that suits our personnel. And we don't yeah. have a fast group of midfielders, but they're all great at getting the pill. And mm. so rather than just say, oh, which are the best three, we've kind of gone, well, fuck it, we'll, p- we'll pick all five and we'll just spread them out around the ground, save a bit yeah. of, save legs, you know, have them in the spots that they need to be and rely on your Smith and your McKay and those blokes to get the ball moving. And... You know, we've always known that Don is very much about a territory game and he's very much about ground ball and all that sort of stuff. And I think I wrote to you in response to your post today, Pete, on Big Footy that I reckon what we're actually seeing is is uh, the evolution into Don's preferred game plan, to be honest with you. Um, mm. I think this is the way he'd like to play. And I think previously, when he, when he started... Um, it didn't really suit us. Uh, it, it was going to take some change in mindset from our players, and so we sort of freewheeled it for a while, which is what we were used to. Um, but I think now that he's been at the club a few years and he's coached these boys for a few years, 
Um, I think he's they've now become more attuned to his philosophy, and I think this is the this is the consequence. And I really like it. I, I think being having specific roles like that for our midfielders and just having them having them all in the team because they all deserve to be the team is is really good strategy in my opinion. Just to support what you're saying there, Fien, um it's when when we don't start that well and we're not doing it the way that uh, we end up doing it for the rest of the game. Uh, Pocky tends to come down in, in that halfway through that first quarter, or maybe after 10 minutes even, and talking to the players, mainly the midfielders, about what he wants them to do. So I, I think you're right. I think it is a <clears throat> Pikey now getting it the way he wants it. It's it's almost like we've got three zones of midfielders, isn't it? We've got Matt, Matt and Rory playing defensive midfield. Then we've got CY and Hugh playing the middle, literally the middle midfield, and then we've got Brad playing the offensive midfield. It's, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And and the knock-on for that uh, in terms of Rory is we're starting to see him take one or two grabs again. Remember how he used to for a while there? He really was a bit of a link-up player on, on, half, on that first kick out of defence. And then he mm-hmm. kind of yep. went missing, and now it seems like he's getting more involved. Um, again, you, you see him uh, sort of contesting a little bit more in the air, and uh, I, I think his aerial work is underrated. And he, he's a good outlet player for us coming out of the back half like that. And to have him actually, for want of a better word, stationed there, I guess, um, means that he's going to be in the in that sort of action more often. Yeah, very good point, Brent, on the chat uh, saying that um, you know um, uh, we're going to have to sort of. You know, ultimately this will be tested against the bigger clubs, and I think my, my gut feeling is that we're still just um, gradually putting this together. Um, and, and I think that we really, um, the North Melbourne game was the game where we, you know, we really looked to be sort of implementing that uh, fairly significantly. And of course, you know, it it went awry, but uh, we've obviously persevered. Um, I, I just have a funny feeling that um, frustrating games like we saw on the weekend um, will be more the norm. And I think that we maybe need to get used to appreciating a different style of football than the um, millennial, um, you know, needing a goal every 30 seconds yeah. um, to enjoy. Um, I, th- I think we're just going to have to get a different mindset as supporters as to, as to you know, what we appreciate. Yeah. Um, what did you think, Pete, just, uh, and, and Donkey as well, I'm interested in your opinion of what, Gibbs game on the weekend. Fiend and I weren't that wrapped in him. Uh, Nicky was more liking what he did. Um, Who was that? Sorry, Macca? Gibbs. I thought he had a good first half. Um, I had no issues with his first half. I thought he fell away in the second. Um, yeah, you just three possessions in the, in the second half. Yeah. And, and so I, I think that, that ultimately, though, the question is, is that, you know, you paid out a first and a second for a, a role-playing half-back. That's yeah. what I'm getting at. And so that that becomes another discussion. Um, but in terms of you know what he did, look, this is what I think about Bryce Gibbs. For me, he was part of an extremely well drilled and well oiled defence, and so he gets a tick on that basis. But as I said, the discussion about whether you know his value and what you've paid for him and what you know could you've used somebody you know else in that position? Well, of course you could have. Um, so that becomes a different discussion. But if you just purely ask me about Saturday night. For me, Bryce was a tick because he was part of that, do you know what I mean, that machine. And, and I thought he did some really good things in the first half. Yeah, I think that, that's a fair comment, uh, Pete, because I'm bringing into my conversation, and I think Fien was as well, the fact of what we paid to get the uh, player playing that position. Yeah, and that's a fair, that's a fair, that's a fair argument to have. And, and you'd, you'd, you'd be fairly hard-pressed to try and make a case um, so you know, but at the end of the day, what you've 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 spent the money now, um, and you've spent the picks, and you've got him, and so then now you just have to actually say, well, maybe he wasn't best value, but you've still got to, you've still got him there, you've, and you've just got to use him as best as you can. And you know, if you dovetail that into the discussion we just had before, he's not that inside ball getter, and he's not a pacey outsider. So um, when we're talking about how we're trying to utilise our players, he he's a bit of an outlier. He's a mm. he's a slower out outside players so there's going to be times where he's going to be able to play that quarterback role quite effectively but there's other yep. times when as you say Pete he's just going to be part of the machine um, and perhaps we do need to get used to the fact that uh, he's not going to be the 30 position midfielder that we thought we, we were getting no. when uh, when we traded him in. The other thing is that if, you, if you've got Matt and Rory who are rolling back there 
who are absolute, you know, ball magnets. I mean, you, there's only one ball. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so, and let, basically, I think unless Bryce brings his own, he's going to have trouble with those two <laughs> rolling back because yeah. they just find it yeah. with monotonous regularity. So that, that that's something that's a challenge for him as well. So, well, I think the um, biggest but, challenge for Gibbs too is that when he does get possession, he needs to he needs to get his disposal efficiency up. Um, because he's not going to get as many opportunities to distribute, and I've, he's just been a little bit uh, haphazard with his disposal this season, yep. which is which is unusual for him. He's usually silky, but it just seems to me he's lost half a yard of pace either through injury, like whether he's carrying something or whether it's just age. But he's struggling to get clear, and I think it's had an impact, particularly on his kicking. Um, and we need that from him out of the back half if he's going to serve a purpose back there. Well, now, he's certainly not. Sorry, oh, no, shout I'm out gonna... to. Go on. No, I'm done. Oh, sort oh, yourselves out. Come on. Quick <laughs> shout out to, uh, to to Nikki, who I know is on the chat at the moment, and she will remember with vivid regularity um, the um, the way that Elliot Himmelberg would play in the SNFL, where he would stand there under high balls, he would worry the defence, and um, he would create havoc by really not doing much other than being there. And um, what a beautiful thing it was to see late in the last where that to play for, for Eddie Betts when we saw Elliot just stand there and put the big arms up. And, of course, he immediately drew two defenders and um, Eddie uh, just was at the feet and it was just a perfect classic old-fashioned play yeah. of the big guy just just competing the two guys worried so they'll go they both go to him and that leaves the small guy on the ground of course Eddie has still had a little bit of work to do at that point um, but um, it was just uh, that that was just classic um, Himmelberg the way that he'll stand under a high ball and draw a crowd um, yeah, in fairness too Nicky um, you know I give her a hard time do you okay Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't witnessed that. He won't, but, get a stat, he won't get a stat for that, but uh, it was a great bit of play. <laughs> but uh, she was right about uh, Dudo, uh, and she kept on plugging that he should be on the side. And in fairness to her, she, was, she did the same with Himmelberg. So perhaps she knows a bit more than I think she does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, but I think uh, generally it was, it was a good win. And... You're talking about Himmelberg. Himmelberg probably segues yep. nicely into the into some talk about the showdown coming up because, as you mentioned yes. uh, earlier on, Pete, one of the little talking points is uh, the uh, fate of Josh Jenkins. And you would think that the only way Josh gets in is if we decide we need an extra bloke who can ruck. Well, I think that that's probably right. And, and I, I wonder whether they think that because... Basically, because you've got um, Port playing, you know, Ryder, um, um, Lysett, and I guess Westoff, um, if you count Westoff as a tool, which is, you know, so so. Um, whether you think that you, you know, whether they're tall, tall enough, do you think that you match up on them with uh, with with you know, basically a fourth tool? I don't know. It's a it's a tricky one, isn't it? And just and you could just leave Elliot in the square. Um, it would be uh, very interesting to see how that plays out because I and I, I think that there's no doubt that that Port's ruck tactics were fairly clear against Max Gorn against Melbourne, and I suspect it'll be the same against Riley on the weekend. I think that they'll go out to hunt him and attack him yeah. physically, and um, I, I think that that will be the concern of uh, of the selectors. It'll be a concern as to exposing both Riley and Elliot to that sense that 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 level of physical attack. And we both know that, you know, Josh Jenkins is uh, not a, a Ruckman's behind, but I, I wonder <laughs> whether they think that, um, that, that ex, just that extra that extra body, mature body may, may do something. I don't know. That's the only argument you could make for it. Yeah. Too. It would make us very top-heavy on what's promising to be a cold, wet night, though. Yeah, I, I can't see a spot for Jenkins, quite frankly. Um, he was dropped for a reason and uh, the chap that's taken his place has done, be- in my opinion, better than uh, uh, Jenkins uh, was doing and I, I see no reason to-, to bring him back, none whatsoever. And I know that it's going to be uh, Riley O'Brien's toughest test by a country mile with uh, two good ruckmen and uh, one that can really leap and the other one that's very physical. Uh, and, but I know he'll bust his boiler. He might, he might get done over, but at least I know that he'll, he'll have a fair crack at it. 
and I'm not sure that Jenkins would do that. I couldn't agree more, Macca. I think that Riley O'Brien is doing a lot of stuff. He's covering the ground quite well. I think that uh, the Big Easy is actually a better chop out in the ruck as well. And I think if they're going to go a little bit too tall, there might be an opportunity for us to exploit by going a bit smaller, especially in the conditions. I just think, I just don't think, uh, I don't think it's the right way. Uh, the only the only caveat, I guess, is that it's given the the likely conditions, it's going to be a stoppage heavy game, and Riley is going to be doing a power of work. And you, like Pete mentioned, they're going to work him over. They've got two mature ruckmen that are going to work Riley O'Brien over, um, and whilst uh, it may not have a huge bearing on the game because I think the game might be played more at ground level. Mm. What does it mean for Riley in terms of his uh, next few weeks? Uh, we don't have a lot in reserve. We don't have... Uh, well, we only really have Paul Hunter because um, Source isn't ready yet. So uh, whether they're thinking about uh, not putting too much stress on Riley O'Brien's body, given the, the likely conditions, I don't know, but... Personally, I think that they're just going to show confidence in him and they'll rely on Himmelberg and, and perhaps a bit of Hardigan in defence to, to chop him out. But it's going to, he's going to be bloody sore by uh, 10 o'clock oh, Sunday, Saturday he night. Be. He's going to be bloody sore. He's going to know he's out of game footy. Can Alex Keith ruck? Is he, um, I know he's quite tall and he's fairly athletic. Can he chop it out? Oh, I wouldn't, wouldn't think so. <clears throat> I mean, you know, probably maybe around the ground, but certainly not in the centre bounces. Yeah. Just, just, just random brain farts from Donkey. Yeah. I, I, I do think the game's going to be played on at ground level. Um, there are always tough affairs, and there's always a lot of stoppage. And you know, one team might get a, a run on for a little while, but uh, given the form of both teams at the moment, uh, Port sort of sputtering along, and and us finding our feet, um, I, I reckon it's going to be a pretty tough encounter, to be honest. Yeah, you're right. I, I think you're totally right. Being that the, it's going to be who wins ground balls will probably win the game. Um, uh, and and you, and you did write about Riley O'Brien too. The poor bugger, he's going to come come out of this game pretty sore. But that's his role, and he's going to have to do that. Um, but is but that's not where the game's not going to be won or lost. It's going to be won by the people who get the ball at ground level. Uh, they've got some of their good uh, ground level players out. Um, and we've got basically all the ones that we want there. Uh, so I don't think there's any excuses for us if we don't win the game because I, I think it's going. that's how it's going to be played at ground level and we should win the ground level ball, but maybe we will, maybe we won't. Well, Wines and Ebert are big outs. Yeah, you know, massive outs. I mean, Ebert's they're been playing forward, but like even that. so. They're big bodies, they're big mature bodies, and when they've got a young team, they are too very, you know, in, in terms of uh, you know body around stoppage, they're they're big outs. Yeah, look, um, the, the big the big fear I've got is just uh, is just wait to see, you know, young Connor Rosie to put an exclamation point over his pretty decent start to his season with a you know breakout performance against the Crows in the first showdown against the plane. That is, I know he's already had I know he's already had a five goal, but just watch him watch him uh, watch him absolutely tear us apart. I reckon unless we pick McHenry, um, it's just a momentum thing. So. Yeah, just just watching uh, with Port Adelaide games, which I do every week, and um, I think I think the way to beat Port Adelaide is in, in the in the midfield. Boak at the moment is playing the best football I think that he's ever virtually ever played for Port Adelaide, and you know it's a condemnation of their coaching staff who have had him on a half forward flank for the last two years when there's no question he is their best midfielder, um, and I think he he will get some positions no matter. What, who matches up on him because he's, I think he's in an outstanding form. And Sam, Sam Powell Pepper, who uh, I thought was going to be struggling as, as he went along, it's just he's had a pretty good year as well. And uh, I think they're the two midfielders that will perform for Port Adelaide. Uh, as far as Rockcliffe goes, he's, the last two games I've watched very closely, all you have to do is put a shadow on Rockcliffe and the jackdaw because that's basically what he is. He, he does two things. He stands outside the pack waiting to be given the ball or somebody gets the ball running and grabbing from behind. That's the only two things he does. He doesn't. He does not earn any hard balls. So if he, you could say give Riley Knight, if he if he plays the job to shadow him and just you, you to basically take him out of the game. Well, I think also Port's defence have been very, very sound. 
um, this year. I think that um, I, I would foresee a game not dissimilar to what we saw on the weekend. And I reckon if you get on uh, uh, combined points under 160, I think uh, you'd be on a pretty safe bet there uh, uh, on, on a night game where it's going to be you know, probably a bit greasy. Um, can't see it being a, a high-scoring game at all. I think it'll be um, it'll be a real uh, attritional battle, and, and I think that um, we have a bit of an edge there with with Huey and C Y in the middle. Who, you know, it's, it's amazing, is it? Those two boys sort of seem to be uh, struggling to get out of the SNFL a couple of years ago. Now I, I see them as two really, really key players. Yeah, and maybe it's uh, C E Y who you put on Rockland or somebody like that. But um, taking you can you can take him out of the game. You and you are right, Pete. The the one area of Port Adelaide which has functioned pretty well all year, except for the first quarter against Collingwood, but that was through due, really due to the, the pressure from up for up above them. Their defence has been very good all year, and they've got some uh, very good players in their back lines, and they and they're not old players either. They're like in the twenty three yeah. uh, age age group, so. Uh, and they've been, they have performed very well, and they performed well again last week in the in the last three quarters. Uh, in the first quarter, they were just uh, bamboozled oh, with all the <clears> amount of ball coming in. Collingwood were coasting, though, Mac. I mean, as soon as they got challenged, they kicked it up a gear and kept a nice yeah. safe distance. I don't, I don't think Port were ever in that game, to be perfectly frank. Oh, they weren't ever in the game. Not, a, not at all. I'm just saying that... The, that is the the one area of Port Adelaide that has functioned basically a lot better than any other all year. Their attack has been very iffy, and their midfield relies really uh, on Boak and Sam Powell Pepper. They're the main two. It's going to be a tough. It's going to be a very very tough affair. And as I said earlier, I think um, guys, I, th- I think that Don probably um, in the taxi on the way home from the grand final thought, well, that didn't work. <laughs> I need to. Um, I, need, I need. I need to try something else, and I reckon we, we, we. You know, we've got we've got a full full kit mostly now, and I think this is what he's trying to implement. So, I see another. I see us now. You know, continuing on the Dower path, and um, it, it will, it'll be like that on Saturday night. And, and I think that we've got um, our defence is really, really tip top at the moment. Um, you know, um, we've got those mids rolling through there. I just. I really think that. Port will struggle to score. I think they'll, they'll, and in that sense, Robbie Gray's loss will, will hurt them greatly. Um, so I think they'll struggle to score, to be honest. And um, it, it, not that we'll, <laughs> not that we'll post twenty goals at, uh, either. But I think we'll, we'll probably just have enough in the tank to get through. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same as you, Pete. I think that it'll be a pretty dour match, and um, and we just on sheer personnel we should win the game, um, and. Uh, Perhaps maybe maybe a very similar margin against uh, uh, Frio, perhaps about 19 points. What do you reckon, Don? Uh, yeah, look, I think it's going to be a slugfest, and uh, I think the Crows are, I think the Crows should get the chocolates, um, but I'm not overly excited or confident because uh, it's Port, and um, whenever I think we should be Port comfortably, well, not whenever, but lots of times when I think we should be Port comfortably, we don't. So uh, I'm... I'm uh, cautiously optimistic uh, and think it might be between 10 and 20 points at a very low margin. Yeah, I'm pretty confident about this one, which bothers me. Um, on paper, Port are struggling, I think, and uh, I, I've been pretty impressed by how solid we've looked. It, you always, in the past, you get the impression with the Crows that it's all a bit flighty and it could and brittle and it could break at a moment. Um, but the last couple of weeks have been pretty pretty solid and uh, we've come up against some good pressure and we've been able to break the game open when we've needed to. And uh, that said, I reckon uh, on the basis of my confidence, Port will probably win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. That probably was the uh, the most dour match that we had played in uh, for what, the years, I would have thought. Um, there, it, was, it was a pressure game just throughout. Um, Players were absolutely exhausted because of the fact that, uh, because of the lack, lack of goals, it was just continuous play. I don't think we'll have enough time for competitions now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, well, so, uh, yeah, let's do competitions. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Go on. Hang on. Here we go.
donkey. All right, ready to go. We uh, have had a massive week in both in both the tipping and a real. No, 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 no. Team. Wait, 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 wait. Now, fire up. This is your moment. You've been yeah, at me all week to get a spot, to have your bloody spot. Take it. Take your chance. Take your opportunity, Donkey. There's probably scouts watching from Osterio or something. Oh, look, I'm not going to I'm gonna keep those conversations between me and those people. Um, and look, I'm committed to the Crowcast for the foreseeable future and I haven't made any decisions to go anywhere. That's where we'll leave it for the moment. Come on, hurry um, up. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> uh, all right, We're, uh, we've uh, got a massive week in the tipping here. Uh, DSG is still on top with 42, tied with Nick Spuds. They both got seven for the week. Nicky New just one behind, also won seven. Uh, Phoenix uh, only got six for the week, all the way back on uh, 40, and that rounds out the top four. Uh, Moyley is uh, storming up the ranks, and Donkey Magoo bothered to put his tips in this time, but uh, received uh, only two above the spread of not putting it in, so... Um, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Massive week in in Real Dream Team. Phoenix has come up for his first win. Who am I playing? Oh, uh, Dennis. Oh, no. Nah, you haven't. I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you lost like 100. <laughs> <laughs> you were really useless at this. But thanks he had like 19 year. players or something. Yeah, well, you should. At the start of the year, the best way to do this game is to pick players that are going to play in the best 22 all year. That's probably yeah, the first thing right. you need to work on. Yeah. No, uh, Donks have scooted up to fifth. So I love talking about myself. So Donks scooted up to fifth, which is very exciting times. Uh, as of the brainy premier is the one that knocked you off, Phoenix. So uh, the top eight looks like this. And uh, that is uh, Peanut is number one of the winter march. Uh, Dylan FCC uh, in second. The bad man Callum in third. Uh, Nathan NTFC in fourth. Donkey Magoo is fifth. Uh, Joel is uh, is sixth with footy and facial hair. Uh, Fabs thirty three is seventh. And Game of Sloans, who went down to the Donks uh, this week, is rounds out the eight. So uh, we've got some good players sitting just outside. Some very exciting times. Some games are really shaping up, and um, and uh, really um, uh, really good to be with you all. And that's <laughs> <laughs> We had, a, we had a couple of good players out of luck too, haven't we? Let's be honest. Uh, oh, look, look, that is true. Um, I um, I didn't do the full dive on this because I'm very aware that um, there are some <laughs> some people with short attention spans on this cast that uh, don't like me going through the full lineup. But I'm going to break down each each win and loss for this for uh, last round going and uh, and the interesting ins and outs that went through. So uh, now, nah, as is as is a bit down, he won the flag last year. Uh, and uh, but uh, and uh, finger looking good. Sanders is also a bit down. Um, and if you rank them on total points, though, this goes so should be in the eight, but uh, just not getting the league wins. Basically, the uh, the uh, Carlton's of uh, the real dream team Crowcast competition. So, uh, hopefully, when their wins start clunking through, they're gonna jump up the ladder. That was I just beautiful. Want to take oh, issue. Go on. Can, can I, just add, I want to take issue with Magoo there about I reckon it's outrageous saying that some of us have got short attention spans. Um, <laughs> You know, with the competition, absolutely outrageous, I reckon. Um, but anyway, I was just scrolling through Twitter as you, <laughs> as, you were, as you were discussing your competition. Noticed that we're doing uh, tish. <laughs> Try the view. Port, port, of, <laughs> port, of, port of announced that Matthew Broadbent is making his return to uh, football after some six hundred odd days. So he's going to be one of the replacements on Saturday night, Matthew Broadbent. So from, the, from their point of view, a good experience replacement. Yeah, it's a good news story. He's at his best. Mm. Now it's time for competition. Oh, no, we've had it, haven't we? Uh, Jesus. How could you well, forget? Thanks. I've got a few sweets and smacks. Have we got the news? Let's, let's do it. That's what I am. Well, I guess I'm away. I'm not. No. Go on, mate. Hit us. Okay, away. away we go. Uh, well, first, I do want to give a sweet to Riley O'Brien um, because I I doubted him when he first was chosen that he would do, that he would survive more than a week or two. But in fairness to the guy, he's, it, as has been discussed, players need opportunity. And uh, I think we are one of the clubs that are very guilty of not giving opportunity. And uh, Riley O'Brien would be the classic case. He's only ever played three games in 100 years or whatever he was with the club before he actually got these games in a row. And uh, he's improved week by week. And uh, Peak nominated him as his best player. And he said if he wasn't the best player, he was certainly around that mark uh, on the weekend. He played a fantastic game. And I know he's going to play uh, against much better players this week, but you can only beat who's there. And I thought he had it 
terrific job and well done. So a big sweep to Riley O'Brien. Um, <laughs> Rory Lobb's no slouch, I'd just say. No, but uh, I don't think he's got a real heart either. Um, mm. Caroline Wilson, I never ever thought I'd give her a sweep, but uh, I did oh. like on Footy Classified. She called out uh, Channel 7, she called out the AFL, and she called out the other Vic Centric media who uh, uh, pressurise the fact that everything's got to be about Victoria. And instead of showing the showdown on uh, Saturday, uh, they're going to show St Kilda versus West Coast. <laughs> That's and, actually uh, hilarious. It but is isn't, hilarious. Isn't I mean, it because it's, Fox still chose it as a game, though? Well, that is the reason why. But Channel 7 had the opportunity uh, to put it on. and uh, Did they, though? They I don't think they did. Well, I'm only bit, uh, going by what Caro said. So, um, anyhow, uh, Caro think... is one of the, the, the fair minded of the Vic Centric uh, yeah. people. But uh, I did like it, the fact she bagged the AFL, she bagged Channel 7, cheap shot. and she bagged her fellow Victorian uh, reporters. Cheap, cheap um, shot. It's cheap shot, Mac, because Fox get first dibs at the beginning of the season. When the fixtures are released, they get first dibs on the games that they want to choose, and they obviously chose the showdown. Uh, I think I take that, it back. I hate, know, I hate I, you, I, I reckon <laughs> she is being opportunistic, but I think she also mentioned that it should be on a Friday night, and that's probably a fair cop. Well, the fact is that the the AFL did virtually promise that uh, it would be on a Friday night, and then they backed down on it. So. Uh, yeah, you can take everything the AFL promised with a pinch of salt. Uh, in terms of slaps, the AFL, uh, and I'm just on that ty- on that topic, they are piss weak. I mean, the showdown is one of the most, it's probably one of the most vigorous, spiteful games of the year and something that I would love to see uh, other teams play, you know, in terms of such hatred and uh, such intensity. And... Um, uh, I think the AFL, they've missed a great opportunity there. I do want to do, build the shit out of the umpires, the umpired our game on Saturday night, last Saturday night. Just, Ten just, free just, kicks. Just a note that we don't condone violence. Uh, go on, Maka. Oh, I'd love to build. Uh, <laughs> ten, ten free kicks to each side. I mean, they must have missed a hundred to each side. Uh, they absolutely destroyed the game. They turned into, they, if they paid free kicks, we would have had a game of football. Uh, but what they did, they turned into a, a brawling mall with just players just scrambling and grabbing and they were around the necks, in the backs, and you could drop the bloody ball whenever you like. It was just a shocking display. And I also want to have a crack at the media, big slap to the media, particularly the port-centric Treadray, uh, <laughs> Rucci and bloody Corns. Jesus. Uh, the bet's free kick. How many times you heard about the bet's free kick as if that was a pivotal point in the bloody game? There were about a hundred decisions like that not paid. <laughs> but we, all we heard about is the bloody bet's free kick. So you guys, big bashes on the forehead to you. And now the last one is, goes to Josh Jenkins. Josh, when you get dropped for playing like playing shit out football, mate, you don't do big dummy spits in public and. Say it was you were mortified about being dropped and it was a surprise, you didn't think you deserved it and all the rest of it. You were playing like a ruptured duck, you're where you belong at the <laughs> moment, so don't dummy spit. Look, I That's don't it. know about I don't know about the rest of you, but that uh, Mac is back. That's one of the better sweets and smacks we've had for a while. Loved it. Loved yeah, it, Mac. I, was I wasn't fantastic. even on Twitter then. I was, I was actually it's I was actually listening, not on Twitter. It was good oh. work. Well done, Mac. Sorry, good sorry, to have man. you back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, chat's hit 600 comments, which isn't bad for a Tuesday night. It's bloody cold. Uh, thanks, gents. We've hit the hour. Pete's got to go to bed. Uh, any... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Pete. No, no, guys. I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> a grumpy old man. Look, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks again to Ryan at uh, Smith Partners Real Estate. Thanks to Down to Earth Electrical. Thanks to all our patrons for supporting us. Uh, those on Twitter would have seen that we had a massive month in April, so we are so appreciative of everyone who tunes in. Don't forget to share us on Facebook uh, and Twitter. Um, hit us up with a review on iTunes. If you listen to us that way, uh, leave us a, a like or, a, or whatever on Facebook or YouTube and uh, write us an article. Write us an article on aflcrowcast.com. That would be great. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you, gentlemen. It's been a wonderful evening. Yep, good night, all. Cheers. Farewell. All right.